Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good? We're almost done. This is actually the last Friday chapel for the semester, right? And the next two chapels, the morning chapels, are actually going to be here only, not in UTCC. So for Monday and Wednesday next week, make sure you're here. And actually, if you come on Monday here, um, uh, our HR team is actually serving donut holes to thank our student workers. And so, like a double thing, right? You get to come, you get to come to chapel, and you get to walk out, and you'll be told thank you for working on our campus, and you get donut holes. So it's a win, right? So make sure you come to this campus. And another announcement, uh, tomorrow night, we have the honor and the privilege of thanking John Wallace, who you will be hearing soon. And yeah. <laughs> We'll get to celebrate him and just thank him for the service that he has done on our campus for 43 years. That's a long time. Yes, he is old. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, right? Uh, but we get to really thank him and remind him that we are his legacy. So come and join us tomorrow. If you have not RSVP'd, because my, I'm guessing majority of you have not, don't worry, just show up and we will celebrate with you. Um, so yeah, come and join us. And I don't want to forget to say welcome to our prospective students who are here. Yay. And I'm going to kind of speak over you and say we will see you next year here. So, yeah, so this won't be your last chapel. You will be here next year, so which will be great. And now I actually have the privilege of introducing to you someone who is not a stranger to any of you. He is a friend, a mentor, a lot of things. This is John Wallace. So, so, uh, so, for uh, 20 years, I have guided with Shino Simons on Walkabout, our student leadership program that occurs in August. And uh, so she knows what an old man I am. She's uh, watched me hike up hills with a backpack on. Hey, listen, uh, I know that there are some students who have been accepted to APU, and this is our season that we call Choose APU. It's good to have you in chapel today. Uh, but I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite chapels. This is that chapel that you can just see the finish line from here. And it has become significant for us as a community to think about the path that God has placed us on the gifts that God has given us, and then what it means to finish well. So in light of that, I thought we should tell some stories today. And, uh, but first, let me introduce you to some guests that I have with uh, sitting in the front rows today. The men uh, who I meet with every Friday, and I'm privileged to be a part of the D group is here. It's good to have you guys here. I know that uh, Friday chapels are some a bit of anomaly to you, but this is what they look like. Um, the walkabout team. The Mighty Orioles in the second row, it's good to have you guys. The historic uh, 2019 women's basketball team. Would you guys stand? They are sitting here. Yeah, uh, Elite Eight, we are so proud. As a university, we're so proud of you guys. About who you are on the court, who you are off the court. Uh, let me pray, and then I want to read you something. We'll see where that goes. Let's pray. Uh, Father, for this morning's chapel, for the conversation with current students and prospective students, would you allow me to, to get out of the way and allow your word and your spirit to fully occupy this space? In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Bill Plaschke is a dearly beloved sports writer for the Los Angeles Times, nationally recognized. Following this remarkable journey of the women's basketball team, Plaschke wrote an article and it spilled across the sports pages of the Times. I'm going to read just a part of that story to you. With 3.2 seconds remaining on the clock, 
Alaska Anchorage guard Tara Thompson sank a long three-pointer to give the heavily favored Sea Wolves a 63 to 62 lead. Plaschke goes on to say that Coach Hardeman calls the timeout. His team gathers around him in the huddle, and they say this, interestingly enough, peaches, peaches, peaches. Peaches is the name of the Cougars' final desperation play. One they run at the end of every practice that has been rehearsed so many times, Hardeman didn't even need to draw it up. Everyone on the team knew they were going to run it, and how to run it, it was simple. A veteran guard would take the inbound pass from just in front of the Cougars' bench and find either the cutting Daly Hansen for a layup or throw it to her sister Savannah for a jump shot. It works every time in practice, but this time was different. Not only because the entire Cougar season was on the line. For one, that was no veteran guard taking the inbound pass. It was freshman Nieto, a celebrated Boise, Idaho high school star who had endured a typically turbulent rookie year, featuring bouts with homesickness, struggles with concussion, and a mid-season benching. Although she's a good shooter, she was in the game because of her ball handling skills. She was there for one reason. She was there for one reason, and that was to pass it, and her palms grew sweaty. I was pretty nervous, Nieto said. In the huddle, there was silence. The second issue arose, arose once the ball was passed to Nieto, about 28 feet from the basket, and the clock started ticking. Unlike in practice, there was nowhere for her to throw it. Daly Hansen had been knocked down. Savannah Hansen had been bottled up. The play had been killed. There was no plan B. Given two options, suddenly Nieto had no options. And so she did the only two things possible under the circumstances. She listened and she remembered. As she stood holding the ball amid the chaos, it felt like the entire APU community was standing behind her screaming. They were shouting, three, two, one, Nieto recalled. And then I heard, shoot it, shoot it, you've got to shoot it. She had heard these voices before in her head as a girl when she would be practicing alone on her Boise High School's court and pretending to be in the exact situation. When I was growing up shooting alone, I would say, this is for the championship, and I would count down five, four, three, two, one, before taking the shot. But now, to actually have the chance, she took that chance. She took one dribble. She fell away from Seahawks defender Thompson and launched a ball that seemingly scraped the ceiling before, well, you know what? Let's just watch it. <laughs> Would you welcome to the stage Lydia Nieto. What do you think? Um, I just, I, I honestly still can, cannot believe that it happened. Um, once in a lifetime opportunity and, you know, it went in, so. So Gary Pine, the athletic director, thinks that may be like the shot in APU athletic history. And a freshman, some, some kid from Idaho makes the shot. How did, how did it feel? In that moment, how did it feel? Um, you know, it's really honestly undescribable. I cannot tell you um, the amount of emotions that were running through my body. I was, I was shocked. I was excited. I was, I was still nervous after the shot, you know. Um, I, was, I was sad, you know. But honestly, the, the, the biggest feeling that I had was I felt totally blessed. I felt completely and totally blessed by God. So, um, Plaschke then writes his article. I mean, this guy, the, the nation loves Plasky. He's award-winning, and, and your picture s appears in the LA Times sports section. How about that for a follow-up moment? Um, you know, I, I was, again, I was completely shocked. I never thought that a, you know, a freshman from Boise, Idaho would, um, you know, going through the year that I kind of went through, I, I never would have thought that I would have ended up in, you know, the LA Times, you know. 
Um, again, it's just completely shocked and it's an amazing feeling, but you know, um, you already recognize the team, but again, you guys, I, I couldn't have, you know, I couldn't have done it without you. That, that shot was only three points, and how many points were scored in that game? Nearly 65, and you know, I, I couldn't have done it without you guys. So you are the daughter of Abby and Sam, the sister of Alex, and when you accepted admission to a Christian university, your dad gave you some advice because at the time, that religion was not a part of your life. What did your dad say to you? Um, the thing that he said to me that I will absolutely never forget is um, keep an open mind. You know, I, I, like you said, I came to this school not really having a religious background. Um, I went to a Catholic high school. It was obviously a little different than this, but I had some experience with it. Um, yeah, but he just said, keep an open mind, you know. Never close your mind. Never be, never be um, open with hearing people's ideas and opinions about religion because it's not, it's not a one-way vision, you know. There's um, many different aspects and many different ways to look at it, and I think it, it, um, it took me time and it took me a lot of people and teammates to show me that, you know, and, and I think I finally realized it and it's really opened up my world to a whole new meaning. So we were talking in my office, I had you come in. I didn't know that you had some space between you and your obedience to God. And you said, hey, I'm, I'm just not there yet, but I'm like on this journey, right? And you said, you know, I, have, uh, I sit in Bible classes and religion classes and I learn about this God, but you said, I see him in others. Who are some of those others you see him in? You know, again, it, it comes to my teammates. Um, one of the main people, though, who has really changed my, here, my year here at APU is Meg Van Ryan. And um, I, think, I think a lot of the girls on the team um, could say the same thing, but we've had um, conversations that mean the world to me. And I know that she is a senior, and I know she's going to miss this so incredibly much, but Meg, we are going to miss you more, for sure. So, uh, kind of an kind of exciting and uh, unusual twist to open our last chapel. But uh, so, as Lydia leaves the stage, would you give her one more round of applause, and then we'll. Thank I'm you. So proud of you. Yeah. Yeah, I love that line uh, by Coach Hardiman. He says, uh, we have this play, we run it every day at the end of practice called Peaches. Maybe later you can tell us where that name comes from. Uh, and he said, and we have no plan B. So, uh, so the ball comes to a freshman point guard who's in there for her ball handling skills, although I think you scored 15 in that game. It's not like that was your only shot. That was a great, uh, great game. Um, and the obvious path to victory closes. And Hardeman says there is no plan B. You see, that's kind of where we find ourselves today, and it's why I love this story. You see, you don't have to claim Christ as Savior to be a student at Azusa Pacific University. You got to be willing to be on a path, go to Bible classes, come to chapel, hang out with other Christ followers, and be open to the conversation as Lydia is for what God's plan is for your life and what full surrender and obedience looks like. This may be my last year as president, but it is my first day of praying for you regularly, Lydia, because I believe God has a remarkable plan for you. And I'm glad you're at APU. I'm glad you came here. And it has very little to do with making the Elite Eight. Um, yeah. But we are in a season when we celebrate the fact that God also was in Coach Hardeman's situation. You see, God has this plan to redeem a lost and broken world. Everything is on the line. And God has no plan B. He's omniscient, he's all-knowing, he's all-present. And, and he sends his son, Jesus Christ, as, as what will become the sacrifice for us so that we also get a plan A. And it appears 
with the time running out that God's plan fails. His son, the Messiah, comes, and after a three-year ministry of rallying what it looks like for those devoted in the Christian faith to turn their faith, to turn their their eyes more, uh, fo- in the Jewish faith, to turn their eyes more focused to Jesus Christ. He is arrested, tried, convicted, and hung on a cross. And those surrounding that moment watch him die. With time running out, God's plan A is an absolute failure. This uh, season that we are in, we celebrate the holiest day on the Christian calendar. We celebrate the fact that God's plan A is our best plan. And we fast forward to a week from this Sunday, Easter morning, when God's plan A is that Jesus conquers death, comes alive in the grave, walks out and says to Mary Magdalene, I want you to go and tell the others that I am risen, that I am alive, and that the, that the plan that has always been in place worked. The peaches plan for the Christian faith came alive on Easter Sunday. And it could have been, it could have been a freshman point guard because God can use anybody, but in that moment, He used His only Son. So let me ask you, what's God's plan for you? What is the, what is the gift and ability? I, I, I picture Lydia, you know, um, she was quite a basketball star at her high school in Idaho, but I picture her developing her skills on the court. What are the skills that you're developing? What's, what's the moment when, when you have an opportunity to do something based on your practice and your rehearsal and your learning and your preparation and, and the rigor of the classroom that brings you to a decisive moment? What's the moment when the ball comes in your hand because of the fabric of relationships, of friendships that you've had here or at the high school that you're leaving to come to college, what is the moment that God is preparing you for in your life? Listen, that, that qualifying for the Elite Eight, that shot at the end of the game is going is to be lore in the Cougars athletic uh, story. But you have a story as well that is lore in the kingdom of God. And God has this plan for you, and He calls it in the huddle, and and there is an opportunity for you to take steps of obedience, and the difference is that it may not happen with cameras rolling, and it may not happen with people going, three, two, one, shoot. It may happen happen in an anonymous, quiet way. As a matter of fact, I think our definition of obedience often is, who am I when nobody's looking, not who am I when the world's looking? What are my steps of obedience, and what does it look like for me to to use those gifts and abilities that God gave me, and the the remarkable opportunity to be at a Christian university like APU, the the transformation that happens in the classroom, and, and really, in many ways, the change that happens in conversation and relationships. I was thinking about, um, about the Apostle Paul in a passage he writes to a, to a young man, I picture Timothy as being your age, you know, he's not really sure how old he is, but he's younger as opposed to Paul's older. And it's almost a moment like this. Paul is writing in 2 Timothy, and it's probably his last words. He's chained to a Roman guard. He is, he is not far from his death. And he's, and he's speaking to Timothy kind of what his last words are, and, and his best example is his own life. Man, I hope, I hope that's me someday. I hope someday my best example for somebody else is the way I have lived transparently for Christ. And I love what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul says to his young protege, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a place in the elite eight. No, no, not really. It's now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge will award me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. I, I love that passage. Paul is saying to Timothy, look, there, is, there are beginnings and there are endings, and I am much closer to the end than I was the beginning. But Timothy, but you in this, you're much closer to the beginning than I am at the end. 
And when Paul describes those three pictures of what it looks like in kind of a, a competitive fashion, almost like what happened to the women's basketball team, he describes it three ways. He talks about a good fight, this race, and the faith. And, and the word he uses to qualify that is the good fight, the race, and the faith. You see, Paul could have chosen any race. He chose the race. Could have chosen any, any place of combat or battle. He chose the battle. Could have chose any picture of faith, but he chose the faith. And he said, in light of how I have lived my life, often in this tumultuous battle-like scene, it was the right battle. And, and in those days when it felt like I didn't have enough to finish the day, the race, he chose the right race. And then he and he says, and the faith. So where are you today? Where are you today as we come to the end of this semester? I'm going to meddle now. I'm going to tell you that some of the lessons I have learned in life is not to leave things undone. So maybe here today, there's something you need to come clean on Maybe it was an act of dishonesty in a class. Maybe it was an angry word or a betrayal of a relationship. Maybe it was having something that belongs to somebody else, whether it's their time or affection or a material good, and you possess it and it rightly belongs to them. We have until May 4th, although that's for graduating seniors, really the week of May 1st. And I'm going to ask you to think about how, what it would look like to use Paul's same words and say, the race, the fight, the faith, what would it look like for you to be in this, the semester, spring 2019 to finish well? Is there something you need to go to somebody and say, look, I'm sorry, forgive me. Is there some professor you need to go to and come clean? Is there a friend you need to go to and say, look, I'm, I don't want to end the semester this way. And one of the great privileges of living in the Christian faith is to have somebody come to us and lay themselves bare and ask us if we could see our way clear to take their burden off and forgive them. I wonder if you could be courageous enough to do that. And then for what's coming, I'm, I'm thrilled that I get one more commencement. May the 4th, I'm going to hand empty diploma cases to about 2,000 graduates. But your God is just as interested for what you will do this summer, those of you who aren't graduating. Your God is just as interested for what your vocational field will be for those of you who are graduating. Your God is just as interested for how you will keep covenant vows should He place you in that kind of a relationship that you could see for the rest of your life. Your God is just as interested in the small details as He is the big details. Your God's plan A, and He has no plan B. You are God's plan A. I would have done it differently. I wouldn't have said, look, I'm going to go and sit on the right hand of God the Father. I'm going to be the intercessor, and I'm going to leave you in charge of redeeming this lost world. I would have come up with a better plan than putting John Wallace in charge. But part of this journey of the Christian faith is to realize that there is something precious that's in place in our hands. The gifts that God has given us, the passions that God has given us, the relationships and friendships. By the way, often it's the stranger that God brings our way. Often it's the person who looks really different, believes really different, acts really different than we do. You are God's plan A for this redemptive world. You are, and you, infilled with the Holy Spirit, will be enough. You will be enough. So I usually end chapel by saying, Shalom, go with God. We'll do that today. But would you stand? I, I want to end the last chapel for me, uh, commissioning you to plan A. Let's pray. Uh, gracious God, maker of heaven and earth, who started the clock of human history 
and you alone knows when that clock runs out. I commission the students in this room for your plan A for them, and I commission them to the life change that will come out of that. Between now and May 4th, for what follows and for whatever will be in their steps of obedience, in Jesus' name, amen. Shalom. Go with God.